Good evening, everyone. I trust we're all well. Just making sure I've got everything set up right, which I clearly do not. Don't want that display. We want that one. There we go. Okay, I think we're good. Mike's having a fit. Okay, I think that's the mic sorted. Time for a new microphone. Anyway, so the plan for this evening is I'm going to be working on the tutorial steps and that essentially means going through this long list of tutorial steps here, making sure that the highlights are in the right place for the buttons and things, and the, um, the direction and the location marker is in the world in the right place. Previews? Which previews? Ah, so these ones aren't too bad. Um, most of them are defaulted to the other, the loading screen, but like this UI here, for example, you can see that it's completely messed up. But if I press this handy dandy button that I made, it goes boop and it fixes the ones that I care about. And essentially, the, the pre-construct um, on, on the widgets doesn't, for some reason, uh, work in the editor window. It works when you actually have the widget open, but not in the world, unless you literally force it to with a button. So if you run an event, then it will work in the world. And I've, I've tried every which way I can with construction scripts and other types of functions, and it will not update the screen live until you click the button. Don't know why, but um, that's the workaround I've come up with. But at least that allows me to size the boxes um, the way they need to be sized. Like over here. So on here, for example. Right now, that's obviously the wrong size. But if I click my magic handy dandy button, it will resizes properly and it's a lot brighter now as well so it's far more obvious to see hey hey welcome to the stream okay so where was I going with this So we're up to the point where we've turned on the valve. Uh, so now we need to go and send the player over to this screen to kind of verify the fact that fluid is now flowing into the tank. So let's sort that out. If you mean, how did I decide on the dimensions of the ship? Um, largely, it was a case of working out what was needed in the ship, uh, and really the ship sized itself. Yeah, the, the size of the ship as it is now isn't final. Um, it's going to be probably extended to be about 300 meters long, and probably slightly less than 200 wide. But it's... You know, the scale of the ship is very much dependent on the number of rooms that are needed. So we know we need 200 crew quarters. So that, you know, there's a minimum size that you can get to fit all that in, plus all the support rooms like mess hall and um, the rec room and all the rest of it. 
Yeah, yeah, with the ring it's going to get a lot taller. Okay, so this step here. Okay, right, let me name this one to something like. Uh, if you turn around again, you should be able to verify that the tank is filling with helium coolant. Right, we don't want that to be a location, that's just dialogue. Uh, we don't need a target marker, but we do need a highlighter. So what we'll do is if we steal that one, so just copy its location and what was its scale? I think it was about 900 by 900. I think those were 20. So, next, that one, that one, press the button, and then we have that one there. Do we need to turn around? Uh, yeah, none of this is localized yet. We will need to set up some strings tables at some point. It's a combination of both really. So I've got a second hard drive that I back the project on regularly, um, but I am also using GitLab. That also helps with collaboration as well. So this is quite a time consuming process doing all of this. Um, there isn't really a quick way of doing it. You just need to place things where they need to be placed. Okay, so let's go for, uh, let's try 1200 by 850. Ooh, almost nailed it. Uh, on one ninety by a forty. Getting there. Yeah, my, my Git folder is about 150 gig, I think, um, but it uses um, large files, large file storage.
That would do, I reckon. Yes, I haven't recorded any of the voice dialogue for this yet. Um, so if there's no dialogue file detected, it'll just wait a set of five seconds before moving on. But I'll do the dialogue last. So if you turn around again, you should be able to verify the tank is filling with helium coolant. Player stands here, looks at that. Yep, we can verify that that's filling with coolant. Uh, and then we need to move over to the other cryo cooler. So next, head over to the helium three cryo cooler. I suppose I better flag this one up. Helium uh, 3 Cryo Cooler, which is on G Deck. It's not a button, it's location, and that means that as soon as the player is within range, it'll continue the tutorial. So hopefully they'll be stood here so they won't be too close to it. from that button, then we go to that screen, then we go to that marker, which is all the way down there. So we want that up here. Just store the location of that. Don't need to worry about the, loca uh, the rotation, and we don't need to worry about showing the arrow. Okay, let's verify that works. So that one and that appears there. This one's a button now. As before, oh, caps. As before, uh, we're on the cryo cooler using its user interface. Yeah, because at the moment the only yeah the only fuel fuel input we have is here, so it'll use this pipe. Uh, and I guess we need on this side, we're going to have to have some kind of manifold where you can switch between the the actual harvesting equipment and an external fuel feed. Yeah, I suppose it could go in the. I guess we want all incoming fuel to run through the, the cryo coolers just to make sure it's being conditioned appropriately as it goes into the tanks. Um, I mean, we're, we're practically right underneath um, the middle of the saucer here anyway, so... Yeah. I suppose it's... They might not be. I mean, you'd expect them to be. But if they weren't, then at least if we're running them through here, we can guarantee that the fuels are going to be stored appropriately. Because all we need to do really is just have the pipes, have the pipes come up from from some kind of connection port underneath the hull here somewhere. Um, and then if we've got a manifold here, 
that these pipes connect into, um, then it's an easy enough switch just to switch over to external fuel supply. It gives a player another reason to come into the maintenance tunnels. The more, more reasons we can get people down here, the better, really. Uh, da, 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 da. So we want to steal that one. Put that one in there. Oops, just miscopied that. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to need. Uh, I suppose we need some kind of like an umbilical nest underneath. Um, I mean, they could be in two separate locations. I guess there's no reason for them to be directly underneath. They can be where they need to be. So you're going to have the the umbilicals underneath the gas collection hardware, and then another set of umbilicals underneath where the um, where the capacitor storage is. Yeah, that's true. And again, those connections can be underneath the actual life support room itself. So that would be, um, I guess you've got fresh water feed coming in, so you can refill the water tanks. Um, commodities such as the um, the chemical, whose name I forget off the top of my head, which, which scrubs the uh, carbon dioxide. All that stuff, all the consumables will need ports underneath to be filled from stations. Yeah, yeah. to be honest, the underside of the hull is the weakest point of the ship. I mean, it's going to help when it's got a great big FTL ring around it, because that's going to protect it somewhat. But um, yeah, you really don't want to face the belly of the ship towards the enemy, because that's where all the soft bits are. Practically where we need it. Uh, that one. Yeah, the problem we're going to have with stations is the artificial gravity, and that's that's not a problem I've kind of satisfactorily solved for myself yet. Because if the ship has a series of field coils around the bottom that's creating gravity, then obviously gravity goes in 360 degrees. So you could perhaps, I guess like a magnetic field, have that so you have a lot of gravity above and a lot of gravity below and not a lot of the sides. But if you put that next to a station, which we would assume is using the same hardware to generate its gravitational field, then you've got these two 1G gravitational fields, which then interact with one another. And then you've got, essentially, you've got the ship and the station then just crushing each other. We might need to head cannon our way around that a little bit. I did toy with the idea of sort of gravity plating, but that just doesn't make as much sense from a 
the technological and the scientific level as having an actual proper field coil. So that was 160 by 60, so that one should be the same size. Is it over there? So tutorial step two fifty. because that also needs a button, doesn't it? Yeah, this is a pain in the ass, but the the issue is that like this screen, that screen, and the other two screens around there, um, they're essentially the same same screen. They're just copies of the same screen. So in order to be able to target and highlight a specific button on that screen, you'd need to give that an actual ID, a unique ID in the world. But you've got four identical screens, so then you'd need to implement a system where you can give unique IDs to buttons on duplicate screens um, and then obviously flag that on the tutorial which is what I used to do here so uh, that's the only one I've got left so the, the, they used to have IDs and then we'd wait for that particular button to be pressed but when you've got so many duplicate screens you're, you're making all these extra systems that essentially you could just avoid by having a target that you click on. So what this does is when you click the mouse to press the button, it also fires a line trace. And if that line trace hits the highlight, then the tutorial knows that you've pressed that button. So it's a bit of a brute force approach, but it, it saves a lot of extra work, you know, writing all the extra code to, to give all these unique button IDs and things. So, you know, basically it's just easier.
Yeah, widgets. I mean, you, you can. I mean, I do with the widgets use a lot of subclass widgets. So you've got essentially a container with lots of um, widget classes which you pull in, like, like like the buttons, for example. Each button is uh, a copy of the same widget blueprint. So, yeah, it, it's just... I, I like the, the Elon Musk approach of the best system is no system. And it's just the most efficient way of doing it. So if you can avoid writing code, then that's generally better. Hi, Prepuke. Um, yeah, so you can see with this one here, um, the buttons and everything are all the right size because I basically set up a, a system where you can just click a button and it resizes everything properly. It's a bit of a workaround, but it works. Well, that that designs philosophy, design philosophy, is, is why SpaceX is so successful. I mean, the best part is no part, and that's why they've been able to achieve so much success by, rather than coming up with complex engineering solutions to problems, just delete the part. You know, if the part is causing a problem, don't have that part. And, you know, that design, design why can't I say design philosophy? That design philosophy um, really shapes everything that SpaceX do. And, you know, I love that as a concept. How big was the last button? Uh, on 30 by Yeah, I mean, this is obviously very manual, but it means there's less code running on all the widgets, and widgets are heavy enough as it is. Actually, widgets are awful. Yeah, in, in terms of code bloats, there's just... I guess they're, they're constantly refreshing render targets, so I've already had to implement a lot of optimization code just to, to, to manage how many render targets are being updated for the widgets. Um, otherwise, they're really, really heavy. So that one, that one, press the button, then go and press this button. And then this one is there. Then we can press my UI fixer to sort that one out. Uh, yes, very much that. So these these widgets, I mean, they do possess the ability to kind of manage themselves, but for the most part, yes, they will constantly be re-rendering at their given tick rate, whether you're updating them or not. So even just a static image is still updating at, say, 60 frames a second. Um, so I've got essentially a function where it takes the, the range of the player's camera in relation to the widget. So as you move away from the widget, the, the tick rate gets slower and slower and slower. So if you're over here, for example, then it's only ticking like once per second. And as you move closer and closer to it, so once you get within two meters, it sets it to 60 FPS. And anything outside of two meters, it starts to slow down. 
Um, and that's how we can have so many widgets at once all over the world. Okay, so that should be all of this side of the room done. You can do. Yeah, you can set them to, to manually update and then you have to force the update every time, um, every time you need them to. But I've never got that to work reliably. Because, um, you know, you have things like like when you click a button, for example, if if it's not updating at a decent frame rate, when you click the button, you don't get that instant feedback. So even if you're forcing it to update when you click the button, there's still a delay and it doesn't feel good. It's, um, widgets just, I'd say of all the things in Unreal, widgets are probably one of the, and at least optimized and polished things. They're just clunky and horrible. I did actually debate, um, not using widgets at all. Why did I suddenly get really loud? That's weird. Oh, I think it was just my end. Yeah, I debated doing away with widgets entirely and actually building my own 3D UIs just using static meshes, um, which I might make go on and do again at some point. That will give us some, some 3D UI elements as well. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, for the most part, Epic expect you to be using widgets for menus and things, not as a like a, a full ship operating system on a starship. No, fonts aren't a problem. Kerning can be a problem, but generally they're alright. So the way Unreal works is up to a million dollars in revenue it's completely free and then after you've made a million you start paying five percent of every subsequent dollar but only if you're making more than ten thousand dollars a quarter so it's quite reasonable really i mean it's it's fair i think i'm quite happy to pay that to be honest you know it would be nice to be in a position where we have to pay that because at least we've made a million in revenue I can't think of any any funny bugs recently. Um, plenty of annoying ones, but none of them have been very amusing.
Oh, that's true. Yeah, before we deleted the um the old um bar, the reactor bus, then yeah, you could get it to infinitely cycle and just get more and more voltage, which was quite amusing. Uh, are you able to tell when the next when the launch is coming? Well, that is a very open ended question because things generally take longer than you expect them to take. Um, like this tutorial was taking forever to finish because every time I go to do one bit, I realize I need to write a whole new system for that step of the tutorial. Although I think we are pretty much there now. I say tentatively, we're literally just on the placing highlights stage. Um, the, the idea is that we've got some lines in the sand for, for early access and that's essentially once each role on the ship has a thing to do um, and I guess that means once there's a job board with some tasks being dished out so when we've got that for all of the main role, roles um, and then when the ship interior is largely done and the ship exterior is done I think at that point, I think we're comfortable for early access. We don't want to go to early access too soon. Um, so realistically, I think early access towards this time next year, so about a year from now, I think that's probably realistic. Um, but we'll still be putting out public demos you know, throughout the course of the year just to... Um, yeah, just to update our progress. This build I'm working on now, um, we'll probably have this go out and um, probably towards the end of the week. What are we on now? Uh, Thursday. Yeah, towards the end of next week, I expect. Hopefully we can get it public, which will be good. Uh, let's get that positioned. Yeah, so actually if I turn off that cold start bit a sec. I'll just show you the um the seasonal overlays that I added the other day. But yeah, so all I've got left to do now for this build really is just finish off these tutorial steps, which as you can see, is just this pain in the ass process of just dragging dragging the highlights around the world. Um, record the voice dialogue, which I'm probably going to use 11 labs, 11 labs for. Um, and then just finish off some of the, um, some of the modeling work, just the engineering room needs a new floor. Um, there are places where the pipes could be routed nicely. <laughs> oh. oh yeah, I added a new sun as well, so you can see that the, um, the sun fades nicely now and doesn't overlap things like it used to. And you get like a nice little rainbow effect. Yeah, so the seasonal overlays, if I just bring uh, the camera there, so yeah, Halloween, so now we've got a few pumpkins on the bridge. Pick up and chuck around, as always. Um, or select Christmas. And now it's decorated for Christmas. So the idea with these seasonal overlays is that they're, they're going to be as subtle as possible. So it gives you that like this one, you've got that kind of like Christmassy feel to the ship, but they're not in the way and it doesn't kind of affect the operation of the ship. And we'll basically take that approach for all of it. So we don't want 
I guess we wanted to keep it realistic. You know, if this was a real starship and people were actually at work all day, you know, they're not going to get, they're not going to want to be chipper tripping over Christmas decorations and things. So, yeah, we'll keep it, keep it tasteful. But yeah, you can just switch between them as desired. And you know, we can add things like Chinese New Year and Day of the Dead and, and you know, any other sort of. I guess it's it's going to be big holidays, which have a lot of stuff and decoration involved with them, so that we can kind of decorate the ship accordingly. So yeah, so that's going to be in the build. Um, host controls are done, they're going to be in the build, uh, and obviously the cold start tutorial itself. Which I am just going to run through real quick, just to make sure that we're good up to the point we're at. The other thing we'll be doing with the the seasonal decoration overlays is we'll have all that stuff in the storerooms and then when you choose say the Christmas overlay the Christmas tree will disappear from the storage room and appear decorated you know, wherever we choose to put it. Not quite sure where I'm going to put it now actually because there's no room in the lounge but we'll find somewhere nice for it. So the um, tutorial markers now have arrows on them. I need to remove the little target thing so you've just got the arrow. So the problem we did have here is that the tutorial highlights weren't responding quickly enough to player clicks and so you couldn't sort of do that really quick and you can now. In fact, the tutorial highlight is quicker than the button press. So do, 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 do. to rescale these ones a little bit. Yeah, so those beam injectors, they're, they're going to be a player serviceable part. Um, so we need to make sure that the player can reach them from the reactor, reactor room platforms. Um, and they'll have their own components and fuel supplies and everything. In fact, they use half of the deuterium, which comes into the, um, into the reactor. Didn't wait for the dialogue then. So 
So that one's a button, that one's dialogue. All right, so that should wait for the dialogue to finish, which we won't know until we've got an audio file. Uh, that one's a location, that one's a button. Ah, that one should be a button. That's why that one went on its own. That one's location. And that one will be a button. Okay. So the way I've set this up is each type, uh, so each step of the tutorial has a type. So be it dialogue, button, location, etc. And, and that defines how the tutorial treats that particular step. So if it's a location, it'll wait for the player to be within range of the marker. If it's a button, it'll wait for them to press it, etc. Um, or we have a, an event one, um, and that can use an event code. So for example, uh, the ship going to warp could be an event that it recognizes happening. I've been refining this sort of as we've been going along, and um, it's quite a good system now. It's a bit clunky to set up, but um, it works well. Uh, as before, uh, turn on the deuterium, turn on the first deuterium. Cooler. I think I'll um I'll insert a couple of extra steps here, just um just adding a bit more verbiage, just some more explanation as to what these things actually are. I need to find a balance between like a, a nice bit of waffle just to describe, you know, the actual tech involved, but not too much that it's boring people. So we want it to be there. I think it was 160 by 60. Got to press my fixy button. So actually, that should be one thirty. Make sure I don't lose the location. Why didn't it copy the location?
Hey, hey, welcome to the stream. Just my own little world there. Just uh, scaling this button. That's better. Okay. I did warn people ahead of time this wouldn't be a very interesting stream tonight. I'm literally just placing buttons. It's a time-consuming but necessary evil. Okay, so turn on the cry cooler. you guys find it interesting it's um yeah i certainly won't say that this is the best way of doing it but this is how i do it i'm entirely self-taught so i've probably got a lot of bad habits Interesting point. So on this side, uh, I've put the button in the wrong place. Okay, it's easily fixed. One first. definitely be some eventual disastrous consequences for opening and closing valves. I guess the first one that springs to mind is the, um, the bleed valve or the relief valve on the tank. If you close that then the tank pressure will just build and build until it explodes. That is modelled, actually. It does do that in the background. We just don't have any graphics for it yet. It'll um, it'll rap rapidly decompress and drain of fluid if you uh, leave the bleed valve closed.
Hey, hey, welcome to the stream. For anyone just joining, we are placing all the tutorial button highlights. I need to fix these ones because I put them in the wrong place. Okay, so that one actually needs to be up there. tutorial step 220 so uh, 220 move that button refresh that yep yeah, perfect there we go next 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 and then this one needs to be down there I don't know whether it's unreal on my mouse, but like whenever I unclick something after dragging it, it deselects it and selects the thing behind it. I've got a, a Naga Hex mouse, and I have to say, every Naga mouse I've ever owned has gone wrong, which is, is not a great advertisement for the brand. It's not wireless, no, it's definitely wired. I reckon that location will do. And that is step 260. Hello, Squarepeck. Those buttons should be in the right place now. So that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Oh yeah, that needs moving too. That also needs to be up there. screen, then we highlight the button, then we then we need to flash that one. In the same place, so that one actually needs to go there as well. the button, then we check the screen, then we go over there, then we press that button, then we go back over here, then we press that button, 
Then we go over here. Then we press that button. Then we press that button. And then we press that button. Right. Okay. Good. Save that. Um, planetary scanning. Yeah. So the plan for that is I got a few things planned for that update, and it's going to require a complete overhaul of the sensor's UI, because that UI has been in the game, well, since the beginning. It's like, if you look at the state of that versus all the other UIs in the game, this is like probably the first one I built, so it needs to bring it up to speed. So it's kind of matching the, the style of, of all the rest of them. Um, so as part of this update, um, this will probably be turned into a tabbed interface because I also want to be able to add um, the ability to scan ahead for future sectors that you're not in yet. So it'll need to generate galaxy sectors separately for the UI only. And I suppose that works somewhat like an astrometrics. So you can put in any galactic coordinates and you'll be able to bring that up on the hollow display and then target something. So if you wanted to go to Sag A, you could literally have a 3D display of that area of the galaxy and then target Sag A directly from this console rather than having to manually type in the coordinates for it. Um, and it will have a new mode um, for planetary systems. So that's the planet and any moons and the planet itself will be visible as a, as a big 3D ball on, on the bridge, on the hologram, which would be really cool. I'm really looking forward to being able to walk around like a big 3D version of the planet and look at the surface up close. Um, and then where the planetary scanning comes into that is that it'll, it'll go through the calculations of generating any life that's on that planetary surface it'll start doing the, the the tech level calculations it'll do um you know what type of life it is what the temperament and personality of that life is you know if they're intelligent um so it'll go through all of the prerequisite work to procedurally generate life across the whole galaxy and when you scan the planet you'll be able to get access to that information essentially as of the next updates what won't be there is their physical representation so you know if they're a spacefaring species it will tell you that but they won't have any ships yet you won't be able to hail them yet but you will know that they are there um, and it will then highlight uh, any surface locations of interest so if there's like an archaeological site or an interesting plant <clears throat> it'll um <clears throat> it'll show that on the ui so in a future update, you can send down a probe. Uh, and then in a future, future, future update, that's where you can land a shuttle. Yeah, a giant bauble. That'd be quite cool. <laughs> yeah, so that's essentially where we're going with the, the planetary scanning update. And I also want to increase the um, the galactic tick rate from from 30 frames a second to 60, because right now when the ship's moving through the galaxy, it's moving at 30 ticks per second, and it, it's it's giving some jittery planetary flybys. Um, so if we can update that to 60, yes, it means it's updating the location of the the ship twice as often as it is now, but um, it should make everything in the galaxy smoother as you're flying around. Yeah, so the, the plans for planetary landings, um, you'll go down to the shuttle bay, you'll grab a shuttle, you'll fly the shuttle down towards the planetary surface. When you reach a, a certain predefined altitude, there'll be a brief cut scene where you see the shuttle flying down towards the surface. And then you'll be back in control of the shuttle above the planetary surface and you'll be able to fly around and choose somewhere to land and, and if you fly up back towards space the same process will happen in reverse 
So we need to have that transition point at a set altitude, both towards the planet and back away from it again. But we want it to work in such a way that where you decide to fly down relative to the planet's surface, that's where it will place the shuttle above the surface. So if you see like a coastline, that's where you'll be appearing above that same coastline. And then you'll have the full surface terrain rendered below you. That's the plan, anyway. I've got a, a few ideas as to how to make that work. Um, ironically, the rendering of the planetary surface is the easy part. It's managing that transition that's the most difficult bit. But yeah, we do want full planetary surfaces which you can walk across on foot or even hopefully at some point with vehicles. Um, you know, I want my canyon racing in a buggy. No, not yet, I'm afraid. I'm still waiting for that um, cat pack to go on sale on the Epic Store. It's, uh, it's usually around about £70, um, which even I'm not mad enough to spend on an asset. But uh, yeah, if it's in one of Epic's 70% off sales, I'll definitely get it. Although I did actually find um, an even better one, so I might get that instead. ship definitely needs a cat, yes. Yeah, I mean, one way we can handle atmospheric worlds is, you know, you can have clouds surround the ship to see to sort of mask the fact we're telling teleporting the player to a surface environment um but all of that kind of falls apart if you're dealing with a non-atmospheric world so if you're just flying down to a moon there's no atmosphere there's, there's no clouds you can mask there's no atmospheric heating to worry about um but i, I just think a, a very brief cut scene where so if you imagine that you're flying in first person, so you're sat at the controls, you're looking out the window, when you hit that altitude, you'll suddenly be put in third person view behind the shuttle, and you'll see the shuttle kind of disappear off away from the camera, um, and then very brief fade to black, and then you're back in the pilot seat flying the shuttle, except now you're above the surface looking for somewhere to land. I think that's about as seamless as we can manage. Compared to the absolute butt ton of loading screens in Starfield, I think we can get away with that. Yeah, so the, the procedural generation we're using 
um, we've opted to go down the routes of making the galaxy identical for all players because we it's not an MMO so as much as you can play it in multiplayer you can't massively play it in multiplayer so we need, we need an, another way of getting that kind of community exploration spirit going on so you know if you go to a planet and just the random algorithm has come up with this really amazing rocky outcrop with a waterfall and some trees around it and it looks really cool it would be great to be able to share that with a friend and then they can go to the same place and see the same thing on their version of the game um and for us i think that's that's the, the critical thing we want people to find cool stuff and share it with their friends and share it with me because i want to go and see it too So we press that button. And there we need to go. Press that button down there. Yeah, you know, a successful Kickstarter is definitely going to make it easier because I can get more bodies on board. Um, you know, when it's just me doing stuff, things do take a long time. Um, so yeah, you know, I need more developers helping, essentially. I think Claire put it best when she said that when it's just me, it'll get done eventually when there's more than me it'll get done quickly because um yeah I don't intend to ever stop doing this it just it takes as long as it takes to a line for some reason.
Yeah, potentially. I mean, I started work. I mean, from like from nothing, I started working on this. It was three years ago. So it was in January, January twenty one. I think I started working on it. So this is where I am in that time. Although, to be fair, I would say that I'm certainly a lot quicker at some things these days than I used to be. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the stream. Okay, so we press that button, then we press that button, then we press that button, then we press that button. Now we go over here. Actually, may as well just do it in order. Yeah, AI is an interesting one. Um, I've certainly dabbled with what it can do. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I don't stream often, but I do enjoy it when I do. Thanks for joining. I think where I found AI to be useful is certainly in research. So you know, if ever I've got any technical things I need to know, be it you know, with fusion power, electrical engineering, astrophysics, you know, things like Claude or ChatGPT, they've really helped, if not directly answer the question, because there's a lot of hallucination, um, they certainly point me in the right direction. Or just you know, simple math sometimes. If I'm trying to work out some formula for something or other, I can just hit chat GPT and it will explain how to do it. So I think AI in that regard is a huge time saving tool. There's also, I guess, for things like um, textures, just like noise textures or something like that, something like Mid Journey. Um, it's capable of doing seamless textures now. So if I wanted just a, a random surface noise texture, I can just go into my journey and say, hey, give me some surface textures. Um, and I can you know, fold that into a shader in some way. No worries, Sean. Thanks for joining. Don't think I'm that much younger than you. I'm. I'll be 45 in 20 days. Seems crazy. How can I be 45 already? Yeah, to be honest, getting an LLM into the game, I think, would be good. I mean, I've looked at local LLMs, and I think I'd want it to be a local one rather than uh, an online one. 
one because you know paying for tokens gets expensive really quickly and if the game suddenly became really popular then we bankrupt ourselves just in token costs um so getting it run running locally is probably the only way it's feasible um but the gpu requirement these days for ro- running local llms is, is huge and i'm not sure that the game would run because you'd have these huge lag spikes every time dialogue needed generating yeah it would have to be it would have to be a fairly small llm i think um I mean, hooking it in is not too bad because they just have a Python interface, so you can just pull the Python straight into the game, um, and then you feed the LLM with the information about the particular character that's speaking. You tell it a little bit about you know what's outside the window, so it has awareness of you know, what's going on on the ship. Like, are we at red alert? And then they'll know. That you're a red alert because you've told the LLM that, so they'll respond accordingly. So there's a lot you can do with it to shape and colour the conversations that the NPCs will have. Um, but yeah, I think we're probably one or two years maybe away from that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I could certainly, I could certainly see like a dedicated AI GPU, like a lo- alongside your graphics GPU, like a separate processing unit, an APU, yeah. Let's call it an APU. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. Stick an APU next to your GPU, and that powers your local LLM. But then they're talking about putting it on phones, and they don't really have much grunt to them, so who knows?
clearing off some of these old tutorial steps because whilst they're roughly right, let's be rewriting most of them. I learned my lesson from the call, uh, the other tutorial, the scanning and navigation one, um, and I kind of went back to the 1980s and decided to do like 10, print hello, 20, go to 10, and like leave 10 gap on each one so that like here I can insert extra steps without having to reorder everything. The Commodore 64 taught me that. So what are we doing? Uh, turn on the back one, so you're going to be a button. Sounds like a plan. Uh, what am I doing? Highlighter, there we go. So I'll borrow the location of that one. Stick it in there. Okay, next step. Right, and then you need moving. Actually, I haven't uh, set up the UI fix on the pumps yet, so I'll have to do that as well. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm placing all the tutorial uh, highlighters. So these do two jobs. One, they tell the player which button to press. But two, they also capture the mouse press. Um, so we know that the player has actually pressed the button. And with it being just a moving target that we can move around the world, we don't need to do any extra code on the UIs or anything because they're just literally hitting the little, little flashy target. We've already set that up as a blueprint interface. Uh, okay, so that's all we need to do on the pump hardware. Oh, and of course, I set that to call in editor. I was indeed five. I actually wrote my first lines of code at five years old. I used to sit down with the uh, old input magazines of my mum and we copy code out and um, obviously you know, write these silly little games that were in the magazine, like hot air balloons moving across the screen. Right, and on the pump widget, we need, are we doing any pre-construct stuff here? Not as such, no. So, let's make a new function here. Yeah, fix UI display. Keep it consistent. Actually, no. No, we don't want to do that at all, do we? We want to add the blueprint interface and use that instead. So when that is triggered, we need that. And then we need to trigger the event on there. I don't think, no, I don't 
nothing else on there needs changing, so that should be enough. So we should now have my button, which fixes the UI. There we go. Nice and simple. put that one in the wrong place. So the ship's going to have uh, 3D printers. So if, if something's completely trashed, so say this pump, that uh, valve rather. So, so this valve is an isolated individual object on the ship. Um, you'll be able to do spot repairs um, if it's slightly damaged, but if it's completely broken, um, then the only thing you can do is remove it and replace it with a new one. Um, and that'll be via the 3D printers and then printing out a new device will use up a certain amount of resources, um, which you'll have to mine for using a mining craft.
Hey ODST, good to have you on board. So the game's objective is quite open-ended. I mean, it's it's largely an exploration sandbox. So the point of the game is really to just explore and see what's out there in the galaxy. But what you find will drive the gameplay. So if you, I don't know, find some spatial anomaly which is affecting the ship in a negative way, then the gameplay from that becomes the things that are happening on the ship and having to deal with that problem. Um, or if you meet a hostile alien species that's attacking you, again, that drives the gameplay of encountering that, that encounter. Um, but as an overall mission, the idea is to explore, conduct science, and make successful first contacts with other alien races. So in the game's lore, um, the United Nations Science Advisory Board have put together this mission to send the ship out into deep space and to look for habitable worlds. So, um, you know, that's that's the overall mission for the ship. Um, but at, at a more granular level, each crew member will have their own tasks and duties to perform. So you've got these sort of micro daily tasks that you're happening that are happening that are relevant to your role aboard the ship. So if you're an engineer, it might be to surface this valve because it might be faulty in some way, uh, and so on and so on for each role aboard the ship. So yeah, really, it's just a it's an open ended exploration experience. Um. No, I haven't had a chance to look at Inworld Origins yet. I've been so busy working on this tutorial that I literally haven't done anything else. Much to Claire's annoyance. Yeah, someone suggested that we re-enable the, the GPT 3.5 that we were using and have that, um, or have the player rather, enter their own API key into the game options so that they're getting billed for the API usage. So it's, it's down to the individual to decide if they want to have those LLM responses in the game or not using their own OpenAI um, API key, which is certainly one way you know we could go about it until we get to the point where we have local LLMs properly. Thanks, yeah. The the ship is built as though it were a real world vessel. So every every aspect of the ship's design is built with the question, how would we do this for real if we were really building this ship? So the location of the rooms, um, what rooms there actually are, how many 
bathrooms you need on the ship. All of that stuff is factored into its design. Yeah, that, that's true. If we can bring down the power requirements of LLMs um, and just get a small one in the game, then you know we can do a lot with that, especially when it comes to interacting with alien species. You know, each one could be truly unique, uh, and you know, and have actual conversations, which could be amazing. Um, the the issue I've discovered with LLMs generally, and even the likes of Mid Journey, is you can't give it a seed and have it return a consistent response based on that seed. So you know, if we had an LLM driving a particular alien race, then we'd want that alien race to be consistent for every player that encounters them. Um, you know, right down to the, the name of that race. So rather than generating the name algorithmically, we generate the name and the lore and the backstory um, in huge amounts of detail based on a seed. Um, and unless the LLM can consistently come back with the same information for the same seed, then it, it's not a good tool for that, for that use case. Um, so I guess we need to see, you know, whether it can be developed that far. Same with Midjourney, because I came up with the idea of also using Midjourney for um, just you know, pictures of the aliens or an alien plant or something, um, just to have it generate it on the fly. You know, we've got an entire galaxy of, of content that we need to generate. So using AI to do that seems to be the sensible way of doing it on scale. But again, unless you can give it a seed and get a consistent result from that seed, then it's not going to work. Our, um, our first implementation is, is definitely going to be algorithmic procedural and not AI. Because we have full control then over what gets generated. So what are we doing here? So open the valve, turn on the pump. Let's have a brief bit of filler dialogue. That's great. Uh, that's the first. First of the two fuels required going to the yeah, um, I shall go into detail somewhere around here about what fluids we're pumping and why, um, but I'll come back and do that afterwards. It's going to require some head scratching. Okay. Next. Let's get to the helium three flowing reactor. No, I already said that. Uh, we are heading to a location. go back and sanity check this dialogue before I actually generate the audio files for them. Actually, that's another use for AI. Um, using Eleven Labs to do the, the actual audio lines. Right. 
So now we need the location of that. We can stick that in there. Uh, helium 3 outflow valve, which is on GDEC. So I'm personally using uh, a 2080 CI and I'm getting 60 in the editor, although I think that's limited at the moment. Um, but generally running around the ship, I'm getting between 70 to 100 odd FPS. Um, minimum spec wise, we, we were aiming for a 1050 Ti. Um, and I think that the frame rate on a 1050 is kind of creeping towards 30 FPS now. We are you know, sort of inching up in the graphics card models at the moment. Um, Claire's got a 3050 and, and she's able to run the game at 60 FPS with everything on max. So yeah, I mean, I think a 3050 is probably a good bet and they're not super expensive. I think they're about 150 pounds. In, in terms of graphics cards, they're definitely at the lower end. Yeah, to, to be honest, it's it's not that graphically um, demanding at all. Oh, wrong widget. I wanted the other one. Give this a bit of a sanity check, make sure it's still flying properly.
all works. Ignore the errors. Chat box doesn't like having the tutorial running. Save all that. Right, so we're over there, gone to the valve. And now, caps. Now open EVM three. The ship simulation isn't as complex as you might think. Um, it's a very much an event-driven system, so when nothing's happening, or rather when nothing's changing, uh, no computation is going on. So things only readjust when there's a change in the system. Like the electrical system, for example. Um, it'll send out its voltage and then devices using the voltage will report back their wattage based on that voltage and then the system doesn't do anything from that point on it simply waits until the voltage changes at any point and then once it detects a voltage change then it will re um, realign i guess the electrical system where everything updates its wattage and its voltage usage and for the most part um Things like lights, which are probably the most numerous thing that's using electric right now. Um, they have their own voltage regulators. So if the incoming voltage is below, or sorry, it's, a, it's above their voltage regulator, then nothing changes because it's still just using its set voltage. So the lights don't need to do anything either. So the whole system's been heavily optimized for changes causing events to occur. And if there are no changes, then there's no computation going on. Sometimes that doesn't go as planned, but for the most part, it works. Generally what happens is you'll have like this like take this valve as an example. So if one player opens this valve, then the fact that this valve is open and the UI screen's updated has to replicate to all players. And also any new players that happen to join the game after the valve state has changed. Um, so you you have to replicate that, you can't avoid that. But the actual, the actual uh, alignment of the electrical system happens on the hosting player's machine, and then the clients just get the result of that. To be honest, there probably is some replication going on, which isn't needed per se. Um, but when we do our optimization, optimization pass on the networking fix that. I think there are quite a few variables which are replicated just in case rather than absolutely needed.
just going to be brief with the text on these for the moment. I think what I'll do is I'll um I'll get all the steps done with all the highlights in the right place. Um, and then I'll go back and make these more flowery in their wording. So you are the helium outflow valve, and you are on G deck. So then we do the pump, and then we do the valve. Okay. This one needs a highlighter. I think that was 130, not 160. Yeah, there we go. So we press that button, then we press that button, then we go over there. Yeah, medical is going to be an interesting one. So we probably won't go full on surgeon simulator with all the gory fleshy bits that that would entail. Um, off the top of my head, what I'm picturing is uh, some kind of, um, I suppose if, you, if you've ever seen the Passengers film, they've got like this, this all-in-one medical bed thing, and you put the patient on that, it runs its scans, and then it tells you what's wrong with that patient and, and what they need. So if it's something like 
administering some kind of an injection, then you would go, as the medical person, you would go and grab the, the right hypospray, for example, and like hit them with it. Um, or if it's an actual medical procedure, then you would put them in a, in a medical procedure bed. Again, it's like an automated computerized thing. Um, and then you select which procedure it's going to run. So if you choose the wrong procedure, then obviously they'll get worse. Or at best, not better. Um, it's it's a difficult one to to, to implement anything like um, real diagnosis skills. I mean, we we could maybe do something along the lines of like a multiple choice question and answer, kind of narrowing down the options thing, a bit like a bit like the Guess Who game, where you're ruling out certain things until you hone in on what the actual medical issue is. Um, but I think more likely we're probably just going down the um, the clever beds route. Um, although beyond just dealing with patients, there will be other things that happen on the ship, like like a pathogen maybe, or, or like everyone suddenly comes down with the flu. Um, so you've got to go around you know, inoculating people or pumping a certain chemical into the ship's life support system. Um, you know, there's a lot of directions we can go with it, but I think fundamentally it's going to be um, player and or NPC lays on a bed, you press some buttons to run some scans, and then you take them to a different location to actually perform procedures on them. Uh, and if it's something simple, there'll just be a bed, like, like a ward bed, and then you maybe have to give them a medication maybe once or twice per day per in-game day until they're better or give them a slap and send them on their way and tell them to man up it's only a broken leg get on with your job Yeah, that's it. Walk it off. It's only a gunshot wound. Yeah, I've I've actually got a location in this room earmarked for that very thing. Because we've got this kind of empty space here that's not really doing much. I thought having like a medical unit on the wall here um, would be good. Maybe with things that are particularly relevant to cold injuries, like cold burns and things. Um, but yeah, I think per room medkits is definitely what you would expect to find on a vessel like this. You wouldn't expect everything to be in the med bay.
Yeah, so the last time we kind of mulled over the idea of shields, the idea is that it's uh, an electrical field which uses the whole energy into matter conversion. Um, and it works very much like, uh, like a non-Newtonian fluid. So the harder you hit it, the harder it is. So it's like a a dense shell of matter generated by an electrical charge by plasma. So, yes, touching it sounds like it would be shocking. I guess if you've got an electrical field of, of that magnitude that's enough to produce matter from energy, um, then yeah, you probably wouldn't want to touch it. But um, yeah, as with everything in the game, we want it to be scientifically plausible. Um, and that's how I would imagine something like that working. So it's not just a, a magic force field. It's actually got some it's got some mass to it and, and you know a reason for it existing. No, definitely not in the TNG sense. Um, I guess a lot of stuff that happened in TNG was was too good, too convenient, too powerful. Like, like with with holodeck technology. You know, if if a holodeck with the safeties off was that dangerous, then why wouldn't you have hollow emitters all around your ship? that could literally just produce hologrammatic bullets out of nowhere and, and just mow down any invaders on the ship. You know, it's, you know, as a technology, it's just far too powerful. And, you know, the ability to generate force fields literally anywhere, again, it's just, I want it to be something which is power hungry and special. And it's not just some throwaway technology that you can just put everywhere. Um, and yeah, yeah, very specific field generators that chew up a lot of power and you, know, you can't just put them everywhere because it doesn't make any sense to. So like the, the shuttle bay doors, you know, that, that's a specific location where you know, a lot of energy is channeled and the hardware is there either side of the door to generate that field in order to you know, hold back one atmosphere's worth of air. No, no, the, the brig force fields are very much temporary. They'll be physical bricks with hardened glass windows. Or rather the same the same element which is used on the actual ship windows, which is some kind of carbon.
Yeah, so the the shield layout I had in mind was somewhat like um, like a daisy, I suppose, where you've got like the central circle um, and then four quadrant petals coming off of it. Um, so you've got your, your four quadrants shields, um, which are independent shields that overlap. And then on top of the ship, you've got like the A-deck bridge bubble. And on the bottom of the ship, you've got the engineering bubble. So the top and the bottom are, are like hardened shells, um, which you know makes the ship harder to take down. Yeah, so definitely multiple shields. The The way the shields will work is that they'll have a, a capacitor bank per shield. So if you think of the forward shields as a, like a pizza wedge shape, then, then those capacitors power that shield. And the shield will remain at full strength until those capacitors are drained, and then it will just pop off. So the shields won't weaken over time, they'll remain fully intact. But what will happen is the capacitors will drain when the shields are stressed. So if you've got loads and loads and loads of impacts hitting the shields, then those capacitors are going to drain really, really quickly as they try and you know, replenish the shield strength. Um, and you'll be able to channel power between the different shields. So you could put all of the reactor's power into one particular shield to keep those capacitors fully charged at all times. Yeah, again, we're keeping it real. So it's every bit of technology on the ship even even the sci-fi stuff you know we're, we're trying to base it on in, in some basis of real science even if it's like pushing it a bit like artificial gravity we're using the same the same principles as we're using for the ftl to use uh, to create the artificial gravity which is the whole principle of energy and mass are interchangeable given enough energy. Turned on all the pumps, we've turned on all the valves, the tanks have got fluid in them. Great. Okay. Uh, that's everything we need to do in this room. Okay, that's just a bit of dialogue, nothing to do there. Now Follow the waypoints back to the reactor room. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
follow the waypoints back to the base of the vector. Right, so waypoints. Steal the location of that one. <clears throat> and what step is this? Four forty. Steal another one from here, so back, 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 back. Okay, grab the location of that one. You're a location, you're a location, and you are a location. Right, so next, 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 next. Yep, do all that. Do that, do that. That arrow sends you that way. That, that arrow sends you that way. Right, and then that one needs to be over there. Okay. 
we have one final task to perform, which is to open the inflow valves on the reactor itself. Right, so you need an arrow, and you need an arrow, and you don't need an arrow. Okay, so that one's just dialogue, and that one's going to be a button. Open the helium inflow valve to start flowing coolant through the field coils. <coughs> Okay, send the player to there, talk about stuff, now press this button. Just to open the three inflow valves. Open the helium inflow valves, stop the blah blah blah. blah. Uh, okay. Now head to the opposite side of the reactor. the fuel valves. Okay, so we press that, then we go over there, Thank you. 
Now open the trons on that side. And it's deuterium. So now open the deuterium info valve. Now open the helium three and the flow valve. Okay, let's go there, press that one, then we press that one. Heh, <laughs> yeah. It's um quite it's quite a manual process, but uh, it saves a lot of code on the um, on the UIs themselves just by doing this. So it, it's worth it. It's worth the pain. You've only got to do it once. Okay, so that was actually the last fluid thing. So yay for that. We're on step 79 out of 100 odd. This is going to be one long tutorial. Let's head back to the reactor controls.
wild guess at the location. How close did I get? Ah, oh, almost. Okay, so we've turned it all on. We're now standing in front of the reactor controls again. So we need a bit of dialogue with a highlighter. Yeah, so the other stuff, I, I, I kind of wrote a, a rough outline of the tutorial um, just to get an idea for the, the actual individual steps um, and then realized that more was needed and some of the I mean, things like um, having the valves as separate objects, because it used to be the case that all of these valves were just buttons on the, on the main UI screen. And it was making this main UI just massive, you know, twice as big as it is here, um, which just you know wasn't working. So I went with having um, physicalized um, valves instead, which is a win-win really, because not only does it save room on these these panels, but it also gives you something physical to interact with. So you're you're literally opening valves on pipes, so it's a much more physical process. Uh, which just feels a lot better. So that's what this was. This was all the previous version before I fleshed it out a bit more. Yeah, it was more just a case of um, just getting my head around what I was doing um, and I getting an idea for the flow of the tutorial and how well it played 
and making sure it wasn't sort of too labor intensive with a lot of stuff you've got to do trying to get a nice flow to it so it's just a, a, a test run essentially um, what this is now this is the actual data table that the tutorial uses so every time you complete a tutorial step it takes the next row in the data table and that feeds it with all the information it needs well that's too big Let's go for 300 by 80. Almost. 250 by 90. Oh, no, a bit more. 230 by 100. Oh, nearly. So as you can see, we now have coolant flowing into the reactor. And this has begun the process of cooling down the field coils. The magnetic coils. Let's chuck a box around that too. Speaking of the windows, um, I do have a few plans for those. Um, there's actually an effect which is quite difficult to achieve out of the box with Unreal, and that's to have um, like a, a secondary roughness on the glass so that it, like, you can simulate um, like frosting and ice, uh, so it catches the sun as the sun's glinting on it. Um, and I might actually need to move over to substrate materials to do that because you can overlay materials on the same surface. But that would be really cool. Uh, but in terms of cleaning the glass, we totally need someone in a spacesuit out there scrubbing at them, like um, like you see in the Orville. That would be quite cool. That could be one of the space janitor duties. Get out there and scrub the windows. Exactly that.
I think we definitely need a player out there. Although the game will have droids. Okay, so I'm going to need an event here because we need to only highlight this button once it's available to be used. Um, we can't really put the highlight there beforehand because the player can just click it and progress the tutorial. Uh, so, let me save all that a minute. Yeah, so on the reactor code itself. Uh, so what we will do Okay, so this is basically checking the reactor conditions so we know whether or not to turn the button on. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I think I'll take a copy of that. Sticker sequence in there. Uh, sticker branch up there. And then we need to get our global event handler. And then we want to call global event by name. is going to do this per tick, so we only want to do this once. So if the conditions are met, we need to do a tutorial event. Can't remember what I called it now. Uh, what did I call it? A tutorial of an update. Uh, it's a tutorial of an update. And then we're going to make an array. And this is just literally an array of strings. So um, if we call it coils. Oh wow. Coils ready. So it's essentially going to send out a global event, which the tutorial will be listening for. And the event is coils ready. So on here, we need to have an event. And that event is coils ready. So when the reactor calls the coils ready event, the tutorial can proceed. Sorry. 
a temperature of 4 Kelvin. Basically, have to wait for that event to occur, and then when that event does occur, they can then press Z button. Let's just grab that. Hey Gemini, good to see you around. Yeah, it's been a long time. A fleeting but welcome visit. Super Squisher, welcome to the stream. Um, I am, in fact, still wearing the towel. TMI, I had a shower before the stream, so I'm streaming in a towel. I bet you're all glad I don't have a webcam. of you, believe me. run this through and make sure that that event actually works. Thank you. 
didn't quite go to plan there. <clears throat> I think the highlight was in the wrong place. Oh, yeah, that great, that did work. Need to move the highlight, but yeah, that worked. One issue I've just noticed though is that the coils were practically cooled down by the time I got here. So if they reach temperature before the player's done those valves, then the event is going to trigger after, or rather before we reach that point in the tutorial, which means then the tutorial will get stuck. Okay. So, right, okay, it's a better way of doing this. So, if we do that. See whether cold and dark is running or enabled rather and if it is then we even uh, yeah okay so we'll streamline that a little bit yeah so if cold and dark is enabled and we're running all of that lot then send the event which means it'll keep sending the event on tick or rather on this tick which is once per second um but only if we're running in cold and dark mode and it doesn't matter if the player is taking too long to do the tutorial, because it will flag it anyway. Yeah, that works. I I did look at a system for doing that where you're locking the view to the to the screen, um, but I opted to use the, the hold F to release the mouse instead. It has the same effect that you can just use the mouse to press the screens without taking control away from the player. I much prefer that as a solution. Essentially every UI in the game should work if you hold F on it. Um, if it doesn't, then that's a bug. I'm gonna have to implement my handy dandy little fix on this box here, I think. Keybinds, what are they? Do I need to do that? Yeah, I may as well. Let's go find that widget a minute. This is a good example of how widgets are broken. So 
everything's all the right size, everything's all good, everything's all lined up on the widget blueprint. And the world is all messed up. And that's because if you've got a child widget, it won't apply any scaling or any settings that you do after the fact. Um, yeah, the, the NPC crew um, should be a fully interactive crew. So you'll be able to walk up to them, start a conversation. Um, once we get to the point where we've got LLMs, we'll be able to have a proper conversation. Um, but for now, there'll be procedural, multiple choice conversations. Um, no different than a typical RPG, to be honest. Um, if you are on the bridge and you're in one of the command roles, then you'll be able to issue orders to the NPCs. Um, but that will be largely limited to the bridge NPCs. So, um, like telling the helm to set a course, for example. Now, there'll be a whole interface for that where you can look at an NPC, um, probably do something like either press F or press the middle mouse button to bring up a, like a radial menu and then you'll be able to use that to issue various commands. Um, you know, we want the captain to be able to easily get the NPC crew to navigate the ship to where it needs to be. Um, I think in the long run I'm going to try and make the hollow display the, the main way of doing that. So from the command panel um, by the captain's chair, you'll be able to select, say, the sensors display, and then you'll get an example of, of what the sensors are looking at right now. And then you'll be able to physically like press a star to target it, and then um, look over at the sensors guy and tell them to send that to the helm. And then look at the helm guy and say, go to that target. But we'll we'll play with that, and we'll find a way which is you know, slick and not too clunky. Yeah. So what I've done to fix this problem is on the on the widget itself. I've just got this um, blueprint interface which goes through the widgets and each one of those has got a fixed UI display um, event set up on them where it reapplies the, the scaling and, and any text changes I want. Um, and that will only work in the editor if you fire it as a, an event from the blueprint, which is uh, the parent of the widget, so down here. So I. I get the widget, send the blueprint interface message at the widget, um, and that triggers the update from there. Um, and you have to do it as a call in editor button. So it appears, uh, where is it? Come back there. So I click that and it updates all of this. But in order for it to update all of that, I then actually have to it manually tell it to. So case in point, uh, this, these buttons here, I need them to update to be the right size. So we've got coils on and coils off. I don't think I got them before. So get a reference to those. Do I have any? Oh, Oh, I do have them already. Wait a minute. Oh, right, now they did scale properly. It's because the error message is in the way. That's right, yeah, so they were updating. That's fine. So we don't need to do that. And those ones aren't needed. But yeah, so that, that's the only way. All right, so just notice then, because I saved that widget, it screwed it up again. So in order to fix it just in the editor window, I have to click that button. 
which reapplies my settings. I haven't bothered with the lines, just the ones that are pertinent to the tutorial. Obviously in the game, it's fine. It's just not in the editor. So if I come back here, recompile, save, it's screwed up again. Don't know why, probably an engine bug. It will get around to reporting it at some point. Although I imagine it's very, very low on the priority list. So that needs to be 130. I don't think I've seen it mess up in game yet, but the night is young, it may still do so. It's taken me quite a while to get to grips, I guess, with widgets because they are really fiddly and can be very temperamental. I actually come from a web developer background, so using widgets after something like CSS is a nightmare. It's like, just give me HTML, it's so much nicer. I think we're actually at the point in the tutorial where we can start the reactor. Okay, with all conditions. Now, cert is, how the hell do you say that? Cert is five, why is that so hard to type? So it's fine, it's because it's half past one in the morning and my brain is still melting. And with all conditions now satisfied, you are free to start the reactor. I was talking to Claire about these buttons on the reactor, specifically the start and stop buttons, and <clears throat> she demonstrated in game how you could like trip and turn the reactor off. Um, so I'm going to make it so that you actually have to hold the button down uh, for a couple of seconds, then we'll have some kind of UI bar that goes across, um, and that's just so that you can't turn the reactor on or off by mistake. Yeah, I, I kind of toyed with the idea of like a pop-up are you sure box, but I think having to hold the button down for a few seconds kind of gets the same point across. Yeah, see... <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, using a security code actually was one of the other things that we were talking about. And yeah, I think long term, that's not a, not a bad idea. Um, so in order to do not just the reactor, but anything on the ship, which is critical to the ship's operation, you shouldn't be able to just turn the reactor off, you know, just by having access to the room. 
So yeah, having a master code to do those things, I think would be good. That's a long way of saying, yes, that's a great idea. Yeah, the problem with physical flippy things um, and physical levers is getting them to work smoothly both in VR and first person. Just having buttons translates well to both. Um, but I do want some physical controls on the ship. Like the, like the master power switch should be like a giant lever that goes ka-chunk. But um, yeah, I'll, um, I might come back and add that after we've started working on VR so that we can get the two to play together nicely. So, <clears throat> that is the tutorial done up to starting the reactor. That's an exciting milestone. It means we're, I'd like to say, over halfway through, but there's a lot more buttons to press. But the other buttons are a little bit more straightforward, so hopefully that'll be nice and quick. Um, I'll actually put this out as a build before I go to bed so you guys can mess around with it. Or rather, should I say, those of you who have uh, access to the development build can mess around with it. Congratulations, you have just started uh, DRG Industries Fusion Reactor. That name is not final. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's not quite a Mark One reactor because they would have been in service on non-FTL ships. But uh, yeah, it's certainly an earlier generation. So another thing I'm going to do um, as uh, Oninani pointed out you could actually power the ship from the start capacitors if you just enable uh, the output interface and go through the process of just starting up all these boxes behind. Um, so like with some of these boxes here that don't support parallel inputs I'm going to have it so when you enable the output feed it will automatically disconnect the startup feed and vice versa so one disables the other so you can never have two enabled at once but for now i'll um just have the player turn it off as part of the tutorial Yeah, yeah, got to limit those speed runs. To be honest, speed running the cold start is a good way of highlighting flaws in the process. Because um, you know, if there are if there are chunks of it you can skip and it still works, then that really kind of points at there being a problem. There's, um, there is definitely emergency lighting. I'll run through the tutorial again in a sec and you'll see. In fact, I'll do that now because I want to make sure the reactor starts. Let me just line this button up. Why is this one so big? So if I just do a quick run through of the tutorial again, you'll see how the emergency lighting comes on to power the ship auto. As, as soon as the engineering decks are powered, they're powered using emergency power. Um, 
and the way I've coded that is that when the electrical uh, power, or rather when the voltage is passed from device to device, device to device, there is a flag which is also passed along with it as to whether or not that's emergency power or normal power. So devices know if it's emergency power or not. Yeah, I imagine um, you know, we're going to have emergency overrides for things. You know, there are going to be times when ships' safety protocols are going to be getting in the way of you wanting to do something. So yeah, so when the tutorial starts, um, it's completely dark. In fact, if I turn off the torch, it's literally black. There's nothing. Um, so the torch is the only light you have. But... So if I turn the torch off, then obviously this UI is the only thing we've got access to. And then as we turn on these, whichever one of these connects to the... That one? Yes, that one. There you go. So. So this quadrant of the ship now has emergency power. <clears throat> if I turn that one off, you can see that like that bit down there has power, but this one doesn't. <clears throat> oh, losing my voice, need a drink. <clears throat> ah, that's better. Yeah, so um you can see that each quadrant of the ship is powered individually. So that's all the G deck power. And then we do the same completely the wrong way around. Uh, for F deck. And then the reactor itself. So now we don't need the torch because we've got emergency power all around. Yeah, we were actually discussing that last night. Um, it would be great if you had a, a physical checklist on, on a pad um, and you had to refer to that as, as part of a checklist for starting up the ship rather than having like an on-screen HUD thing. Um, but I think we'll do that in addition to the tutorial because the point of the tutorial is really to you know, teach players how to do it in, in, a, in a, a straightforward and user-friendly way as possible, whereas having to look down at a pad continuously um, is not as easy to find your way. Or, to put it another way, Claire needs to be able to do it. I don't know if she's still listening to the stream. She might have gone off. I might have got away with that. Oh no, I didn't get away with it. So that one should be there. So that needs moving. 
and they also auto continued as well. Okay, so those two need fixing. Actually, these screens here are a good example of the um, optimization I had to add. So, if you watch the little progress bar along the bottom, you can see that it's going at a really slow rate. And if I stand over here, you can see that now it's going at 60 FPS. And that kind of changes depending on how far away you are. See, so that one over there is slower. This is our biggest UI to date. This one's huge. I don't know if I mentioned this actually, but I have actually added the, um, the external feed and the solar array onto the main battery distributor. They're not actually connected to anything yet, so that will just sit there for now. After you turn on those, that powers this, which caught me out earlier because they're not powered otherwise. Like that one's off because these are not on. wouldn't I want an electrical circuit to fall in love with me? Okay, which means 
we can finally switch to live power. Hurrah! And then do this all the way around. Bing! This is actually my favourite bit with the Cold Star tutorial. It's when you come into the bridge and it just looks like this. It's so atmospheric. And you get the lights on. And you power up the stuffs. might have actually just crashed the engine. Yeah, in terms of the breakers, it's 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 a bit of a balancing act because the, the the reactor starts and is self-powering, but you don't want an immediate draw on that reactor, so you need the reactor to be sort of up and running. Um, oh, there we go! It finally died. Um, yeah, and, and if if everything is coming on at once, then you're going to have this this huge spike in in electrical draw. For some reason, I seem to have lost control of everything. Great. What's going on? Um, but yeah, so, so the way I've done it on the tutorial is only the output breakers are off when you're doing a cold start. So all the input feeds are connected. Um, and then you just have to go around and enable all the output feeds. So you're starting the ship up in, in stages. But um, I guess through playtesting, we'll kind of hone in on whether or not there are too many breakers to turn on, um, or not enough even. You know, it depends on, on where the sweet spot is. I think the my biggest problem with the current number of breakers is that you have to run around the um, the maintenance tunnel ring twice because you're going around once to enable all the battery feeds and then again to enable all the aggregators which takes the power back down to the reactor room um, but that is a two-step process and we don't want to rush I guess we don't, we don't want to cheapen the cold start because it is a complex process and there is a lot of stuff on the ship to start up um, but yeah, I guess, you know, we just need to find the sweet spot with it. But for some, some odd reason, my escape key no longer works. I can no longer hold my right, but my right mouse button to move. I can use my left mouse button, though. UE5 done broke itself. Just kill that and restart in a minute. The old weekly turn everything on with your face move.
<laughs> yeah. I keep it around for posterity. And that one as well. But as you can see, I am... Um, I haven't opened either of those projects in a long time. A long time. To quote Obi-Wan. I very much have my hands full with this. Right, so we had a couple of issues to fix over here. set to dialogue and they should be set to buttons so that's one problem uh, that should be like that right so if we set that to step 490 Oh, that's better. So we do that one, then we do that one. So they are in the right place. That's fine then. Then we do that, that, that. We wait, then we do that, then we do that, and then we do that. Where's the target marker? Why is it up there? the button and now we need to clicky the other button okay and now uh, and now connects the reactor to its Again, I will um, word these with better words later. My brain can only think of the simpler words right now.
if we now head around to the opposite side of the reactor, we'll find the output distributor is powered up. I'm going to make this the last step because it's 10 past 2 in the a.m. and uh, we need our beauty sleep. Plus my brain's gone mental. What was I doing? Right, yeah. Grab location of that. Stick that in there. Reactor output distributor. I must have typed the word distributor easily several thousand times over the past few weeks. It's been crazy. do we have left? So press five buttons there, press eight buttons there, run through here, press six buttons there, press six buttons there and there, We need to kind of just bring the player into here just to verify that these are actually charging. So we'll do a visual inspection to make sure the battery units are, battery cells rather, are charging from the reactor. Uh, and once we verify that, um, we'll go ahead and do all the uh, aggregators, which is that thing and that thing. Once we've gone around and done those, we then run back to the reactor room. We press seven buttons on there, and on there, and on there, and on there. And then we uh, switch that to main power, that, that, that to main power. And then we do that, 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 that to main power. And then we run all the way up the stairs to the bridge. We get lost in the wall. We click those two to main power, and that is the tutorial done. So I would say I could probably get that done by tomorrow. So once once that job's done, um, the next thing I need to do then is record the voice lines on Eleven Labs and just finish off some modeling like like these boxes don't fit so that needs tidying up um i need to do the floors in this room i shouldn't be too arduous just do a few floor panels um i do need to finish these stairs i've started modeling the steps but didn't do these ones so I just finish those off um yeah run this railing using my railing tool that I made so we can go like whoop, like that to run the railings around and then we can tell it how many balustrades to put in so we do that um yeah then I think at that point that is pretty much everything done 
Um, I was going to model the pump hardware, but that's going to add another week to the time scale, so I won't bother. I'll leave it like that for now. Um, yeah, so there we go. I think that is about all that's left to be done for the tutorial, which is nice. That was my best Discord that beats. Yes, that was Claire saying, it's really late, we should go to bed. And I agree. She gets cranky when she's tired, so you know we shouldn't ever let her get tired. She'll take it out on everyone on Discord. And you specifically, Robert. Right then, so. Here's where I try and remember how to stop a stream. There we go. Okay, thank you for watching everyone in what has been a long stream. How long was I actually streaming for? I don't even know. Oh, almost four hours. No, that's not bad. Yeah, we're four minutes short of a four hour stream. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks again, everyone. And um, I will try and do another stream soon. Catch you later.